Okay, today I, I'd like to share with you something that uh, the ladies, we we did a study on a while back on this book called Empty Promises, and it's really good because it opened my eyes to some things that I didn't realize. And I just want to start off with a couple comments that were made. Uh, Mother Teresa once observed that in India, people are starving physically. But in America, people are starving spiritually and emotionally. And it is true. Sometimes we think of all the starving, and it's terrible. But here we have so much to call upon and information and the freedom and we're starving inside with that spiritual hunger and and, uh, starvation. God wired each one of us to have a spiritual hunger that can only be satisfied by him. Because after all, he created us. He created us for him and that relationship. And I think that's why there's always a hunger stirring within us some way. Even from a small age, as we grow up, there's just something we're obtain- we want to obtain in life. We feel we need. We need love. We need acceptance. We need something. And in this book, it was really neat how he brought up all the things that, uh, well, I'll just read it. Um, we use phrases like, there's got to be more to this life. I'm bored. I'm restless. I'm empty, and I'm just unfulfilled. Or even, I feel like something's missing. I don't know what it is. Well, there's that gnawing hunger inside. And we make a mistake a lot of times by looking for that satisfaction for that hunger in the wrong places. And we're all guilty of it in some way. We just don't realize it. I mean, we yes, we're walking. We're we're believers. We have Christ. And that should be our all in all. But it's easier said than sometimes we really walk in that walk. Um, The idols that we create is what this book is about. And it's not just idols. We look at, we think, what's the first thing you think of when you hear the word idol? A graven image or something or money. But this book really brought out a lot of things about what's in our heart. We have the idols that we create in our own hearts when we fail to look to God to meet our deepest needs. These idols are what I call the seven P's. And he lists them. I thought they were neat. They all started with a P. Seven P's, pleasure, there's prestige, and passion, position, popularity, performance, and possession. And if you look at each one of them, we're all, those are things that we have a passion for in some way. We're looking for pleasure. It's not bad. Prestige, it's not bad. Passion is good if it's geared in the right way. And all of these things, position, popularity, performance. And you can pick any one of those. And sometimes you think, well, that's for other people. I don't have that problem. But if we look deeper into our hearts and pray about these things with the Lord, I'm sure he'll show each one of us. He showed me a lot of these things when I was reading this book. So I thought it was really interesting. And this is what is called empty promises, when we go in the wrong way, in the wrong places to obtain these things. Advertising is one of those things that can lead us down that road. If you just look at anything, a magazine, turn the TV on, everything, it's what we should be. What should we be looking like? What should we have? The newest car, the newest thing, the best home. Turn on Home and Garden. It's like million-dollar homes or whatever. And sometimes we just start thinking, well, maybe I don't have it all, you know. And sometimes it makes us not content with what we have. And those are one of those things that I think can just steer us out of that way of thinking. Like, we are so blessed, but then sometimes we get sidetracked with looking at all these other things that sort of filter into our thoughts. I could be with a friend and think, I have it all, everything is great, I'm satisfied and content. And then all of a sudden, they're saying about, well, this and that, they're getting that, and they have this, and they're going to do, and like, well, maybe something's wrong with me that I'm not really in that. But you know what? It could actually stir up a desire for things that aren't even necessary in our life. But did you ever have those nights where you're great? This is one of my, I love this because I can relate. Did you ever have uh, one of those late-night refrigerator aids? 
where you're just like searching. You just want something. You're going to the kitchen. You're looking for, I'm just, I feel like I want something. I'm hungry. And you look in the fridge. You, t- you look and you stare. You know what's in the fridge. Then you go to the cover. You know what's in the cover. You take a little of this. You take a little of that. Pretty soon you've grazed your way through the kitchen. And then later on, you're still not satisfied. You're thinking, I'm still hungry. And I was eating all these things, but it was all the wrong thing. We we're just looking for something. And we go to bed. Uh, yes, that's ice cream, chips. Yeah, sweets. You switch back from the salty to the sweet. Then you go back, and it's like, oh. But you know what? I can understand and relate to that. But that's sort of how we live our lives. We're sort of like great. We're like looking for something and tasting all of that. And like, I'm going to, okay, this is my thing. I'm going to obtain position. If I could just get to this place, then I'm going to feel good about myself. If I look this good, I'm going to go on this exercise workout. I'm going to feel good about myself. Then I'll be something. Then I'll be accepted. Then I'll feel like everything is okay. And so many of us can fall into that trap so easily and so subtle. We don't realize it's happening. So the best thing, and one of the things you realize is when you go to bed, you are still hungry, something is still lacking. All those things weren't what you were looking for. And what we need to know is uh, Christ is the one who fulfills all the needs that stem from. He's the one that gives us everything. All our satisfaction comes. He gives every good thing to us. Um, And... I'm going to just keep those in mind, but I want to go to Psalms 37, 4. It says, take, take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desire, or give you the desire of your heart. And it's like he said, it's delighting in the Lord is what we need. It's not delighting in the things, the desires of our heart, because he's going to give us those desires that are his. And so when we put our desires in him first, it's, in, it's all about seeking Christ, not about what our needs are. Then, all the other things, we become content and satisfied. He is the biggest gift. He's the giver of life. Um, have you been on a journey where there's certain... Uh, well, I think I skipped a page here. Sorry. No, I'm right. You've been on a journey all your life. From the day that we're born, we have a longing. It's just built into us because God created that. And there are certain things in you, that your soul longs for on this journey. Whether you you realize it or not, your life is shaped by your search for these things. You're designed to throw all your energy and your respect toward whatever you believe can provide you with what you desire whether you're desiring purpose, like, I want to have a purpose in life. What is it? Something. We just walk around sometimes. We just don't know what our purpose is, but a lot of times we already are walking in what God has purpose for us. Um, We're looking for worth and significance, acceptance, security. We're looking for beauty, love, all these things. But we all long for more of something in our lives. And all these things, a lot of things stir from, I think, acceptance and love also because if we really knew the love of God, what he really has for us, we wouldn't need to feel that desire to have it met in other ways. Because when we truly understand we are loved by him, we are called by him, he knows our name, he knows everything about us, we will have that acceptance. And I see that too many times when that leads to a lot of addictions, a lot of problems, a lot of bondages um, that we fall into. It's a trap. And the question that he states here, It's simply put, we are a people wired to worship. The question isn't, do we worship? The question is, who or what shall we worship? And there's that thing that exists in all of us. Ultimately, it should lead us to the person of Christ who fulfills our desires. Um.
The thing about worship is we can, can, we can even worship our own ideals. We can worship our own uh, self-effort. Because a lot of times the whole name of the game in society is how good are you? What are you going to do? How are you going to do it? And a lot of times we do it in the wrong way. If we have God's strength in us, God's guidance in us, we're going to deal with life so much better. But we do it so, I, a lot of times I think, we do it the hard way instead of taking the easy road. Jesus said, give me your burdens to me. I'll take those burdens. I've already accomplished everything that you need on the cross. It's easy to fall into the trap of also the uh, if onlys. And we'll go to Ecclesi, or I'm sorry, let's go to Ezekiel first. Ezekiel 14.3 says, Son of man, these men have set up idols in their hearts and put wicked stumbling blocks before their faces. Should I let them inquire of me at all? Here he's talking about the idols in our hearts, not just idols. So there is a heart issue involved here. Our culture is set up to be, like I said, defining yourself. But it's all from him anyway. He's the one that helps us to acquire the things that we have. He's the one that blesses us. And I want to point out, too, he brings up the fact of what he says idolatry is. And listen to this carefully, because I, I had to read it a couple times over to make it. Because traditionally, I, an idol is something that we define as anything that is more important to us than God. And that's true. But when we look at the, his idea of the idolatry is when I look to something that does not have God's power to give me what only God has the power and authority to do and give me. Does that make sense? And when you look at it like that, it gives you a whole new way of thinking about how you look at things. It's when we take the good things like a successful career, love, material possessions, even family, and turn them into <clears throat> the hope that they'll provide something that only God can provide. So then if we, do it, if we look at life in the, that form of idolatry, we're always, always going to be unsatisfied. We're always going to want more. <clears throat> so it's when we feel a God-given appetite and try to fill it with or something that isn't God. And it made me think, isn't that the way we pray the daily bread? Give us our, this day our daily bread. And it, the Bible talks about being filled with the living water. These things are what we need to keep us going. It's not all the other things. <clears throat> now I'm going to go on to the if-onlys. If we go to uh, Ecclesiastes 1.8. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear is full of hearing. It's talking about not having enough. You're going to ever see, but never have enough seeing. You never hear enough. This is the f onies that he listed. If only I owned this, I would feel worthy. If I achieved that, I would feel significant or respected. If I had what they had, I, wouldn't, I would be content then. If I get the promotion, I, wouldn't feel, I would feel more valued. If um, I made a little more money, I'd feel more satisfied. And if only I could get that person to love me, I would have that security. How many people we see that are broken because of these false senses of ob obtaining these passions. And I like this. C.S. I have a lot of quotes here, but just the bear with me. I thought this was good. C.S. Lewis wrote, <clears throat> Most people, if they had really learned to look into their own hearts, would know that they do want and want acutely something that cannot be had in this world. There are all sorts of things in this world that offer to give it to you, but they would never quite keep their promise. They're always going to let you down. And it's, 
Uh, the scripture is full of examples even of our constant need to grab at almost anything to try to fill them with deep building longings for worth, significance, and etc. And a good point is to look at uh, even when Moses and the Israelites in Ezekiel, or I'm sorry, Exodus 32, verse 1, When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Well, okay, God delivered them from bondage from 400 years, took them out through all this, and was with them in the cloud and the fire and fed them. And Moses goes up to the mountain to get the Ten Commandments, And waiting was not one of the things that they wanted to do. And right away, I was just shocked. You know, I mean, I've read this so many times, but it's like they got tired of waiting. It's like, when's this guy coming down? Okay, we're getting tired of this. Let's build something else. Right away, their minds and their hearts had turned to building another god or gods out of images, like for the gold. And in verse 4, it, he took what they handed them and made it into an idol, cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. And then they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. How, what a lie. I mean, could you imagine? Their God had just done all this for them, and they're already making a ca- calf, and then proclaiming what God did to deliver them and giving the credit to these false images. But, you know, we shouldn't be so harsh to do that judgment on the Israelites because deep down, if we look into our lives, it's not as harsh as that, but we can do that. We do it in our lives and not realizing it. Um, And it wasn't enough. See, their need for hurry, I like this statement. He says, when the need for hurry meets the desire for control, it becomes really easy to start worshiping someone or something other than our creator God. And we are in a society to be in a hurry, and we want what we want now. And who wants to wait, especially when God's timing is not our timing on certain things? Or we're waiting for that right person to marry. We're waiting for that right time to have a child. We're waiting for that right God's not, his time is his time. But then when we don't want to wait and we want to control the situation, that's when we get into trouble and we can start seeking after different ways. Um, In Exodus 20, verse 3, God's very first commandment was, you shall have no other gods before me. And it's interesting because that's the first real commandment. And if you think about it, if you have other gods before you, you can't keep the other ones anyway. I mean, we can't keep them all, but it's just an idea to make it, if you can't, if you don't put God first, you're going to have all these other sins come through, the lust and, and murder and stealing. All these things can happen if you're not putting God first. <clears throat> so it was like the moral code in history that would have, have uh, uh, that. Well, I'm sorry. The first, very first law of the first famous moral code in the history of the world has to do with the trap of idolatry. So, we need to let God be in the central of our life to keep things in the right perspective and free from turning to idols. It's no surprise that because about idolatry, another thing is that it will wear you out. Idols don't have capacity to breathe life into us. Only God does. All they do is take and take and take. And did you ever, I know I do this, I'm just using myself as an example, but I want to do the right thing. I want to love God with all my heart. I try to do my best. But sometimes I get this idea that, okay, now I'm going to do all this, 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 so that everything will go right. And I put all my trust in my own self-effort to do these things, and then I'm missing the relationship. 
part with the Lord. I'm either striving to learn and study and repent and do whatever I need, or I'm missing the part where I'm just sitting and talking with the Lord and saying, what do you want to talk to me today about? What can we, you know, what are you speaking to me today? That's the part of the relationship. But when we put other things in our heart that we want to strive for, it becomes overpowering to our relationship with the Lord. Performance is one of those P's. And I like this performance one because it's also very exhausting. Ask yourself these questions because I think they were great to ask. Are you looking into your own life? Are you tired of trying to keep the perfect house, striving to have the perfect marriage, the perfect kids, the perfect lawn, the perfect car, having everything new, feeling the pressure to look like you just walked out of a magazine, Are you putting that pressure on yourself to look so good and what you wear and how you look, St- um, struggling to raise perfect kids who excel academically and socially so you can, <laughs> so you can have that uh, praise to my kid did that, um, you know, I'm so proud. <laughs> working to make more money than anyone else in your circle. All these things, if we're not careful, can sort of trickle their way into our lives and take hold. So are you weary of all the empty promises that you are longing and aching for? These performance-driven lifestyles is just another form of idolatry, if you think about it. And it, This is a pastor that wrote this book. I mean, he's he's dealing with this in his own life, and that's why I wrote the book. That's why I thought it was so neat. He even, um, these are some of his questions, and the questions that he was deceiving, he said, I'd been deceiving myself in a number of ways, convincing myself that I could find self-worth from several empty promises. These were questions that I could no longer ignore. These are his questions about himself. Why do I continue to say yes to others even though I'm overextended and hurting those closest to me? Why do I continue to struggle with showing my wife love on a more consistent basis the way I should? Or husband. You could put that in for yourself, wife or husband. Why are my emotions affected more by how many people show up at a church than by just being in the presence of our creator God? And why do I continue to strive to find my identity in things like acceptance, power, money, instead of in who God says that I am? Who does God say that you are? Dearly loved, my child, That's what he says to us. That is our total acceptance and love that should just envelop us when we think about it. That all this other stuff is just trivial, silly little things. But we tend to let the world sort of gear our focus away from that into other things. In Proverbs 14, 12... (coughs) It warns us there. It says, there is a way that seems to be right, but in the end it leads to death. It's that spiritual death, like he was saying in the beginning. You're going to be hungry and unsatisfied, and it's all because you're striving and looking for things in the wrong places. God wants us to have possessions. God wants us, he blesses us. He wants us to have all these things, love, but not at the expense of hurting ourselves and others and losing that um, communicating with the Lord himself and looking for him, to him for the being the provider. Um, and I want to read this last, and I'll wrap this up. What if there were another way, a way that gives life instead of inter inducing stress you see i believe that god has not given up on you he is in fact powerfully present in your life 
even if it seems that he is absent. He has revealed himself through a man, Jesus, who came to earth to show us how to live and then died for our sins. In his resurrection, he gave us hope that we can indeed experience the fulfillment of our desires. Jesus is continually inviting people to give up their idols and follow him, Jesus, and Jesus alone. If, and Jesus alone is worthy of our whole devotion. He alone has the authority to forgive all of our sins. He alone has the wisdom to guide our whole lives. He alone leaves us invigorated rather than exhausted, at peace rather than anxious. He alone has the power to fill the gnawing inner emptiness we all experience and bring purpose to each and every day that he seems fit to grant us as a gift. And I wrote a thought to, as I was writing some of these notes, I would hope that at the end of my life, I would not regret chasing after the wrong things, the wrong dreams, and not living that fulfilled, joyful life that Christ died to give me. And I hope that this will be a challenge for the for you to just ask God to show us what's in our heart, what idols we may be seeking after, and just look to him for the answer. It's that, that's with you and him. So let us close. Prayer. Lord, we thank you, God, that you are the one who gives life. You are the giver of life, the creator. Lord, you've given us everything that we need. And Lord, sometimes we look past the thing that's right there with us, you. I just pray for each one of us, Lord, that you would just show us some of those areas where we may be chasing after things and looking in the wrong places and not being fulfilled. And Lord, we want that fulfillment and satisfaction that comes from you, Lord. Show us, Lord. Teach us. As we leave this place, I just pray a blessing upon each one of us, Lord, and our families. And we thank you, Lord God, for it's a privilege to be with you. I called a child of God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.